scared and their brains are switched on and they're self switched off. Okay. Okay. Diana. I, I, oh, Denmark. There you go. Hi, Diana. Are flying monkeys also narcissists? Sure, some can be, but most are not. Or can they be non-narcissists who have been brainwashed by the narcissists to be flying monkeys? That one. But they're more susceptible to it. Okay? So they don't they don't have the self-awareness, right? They're easily influenced, man. If if I don't know who I am, I'm easily influenced, right? Children. Children will, will try this style. I'll go spike my hair up this week, you know, and try different colors and be a punker and put a little fake nose ring in my nose. And then next week, no, I'm gonna comb my hair down, I'm gonna be preppy. Really, just, just easy. I need to switch who I am like this because I don't know who I am. Right? And so flying monkeys are people who have been wronged and don't understand it, haven't healed. So when they see someone wronging someone else, they're ready to attack, man. Ready to attack. And and, and that's just pure judgment. And imagine ruining someone's life just because somebody said they're bad. You don't you don't know either person. This this can, this happens all day long in YouTube. You've got somebody out there saying this person's a bad person. And you're watching, and you don't know the person they're talking about, and you don't know the person talking, but you're just going to say, oh, what? They did what to you? I'm going to go attack them, and they go attack them. Who the hell are you? And I'll get these pe the same people that do this and say, because you're not respectful. Well, you're not being respectful. Well, you're not being honest. Well, you, can you honestly say that you're a great person that, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, is there a scale of narcissism? How far into narcissism does a person have to be before they will not be able to turn back and stop being narcissistic? Okay, so narcissism is a spectrum you can say we are all on. Okay, narcissistic personality disorder is a very distinct criteria. And we, we typically, this isn't something that adults just start doing and becoming and then come out of it if they get too close. Something, no, it's a disorder personality disorder which is formed throughout their childhood and diagnosed into adulthood and the best way I can help understand it a little bit and I don't even know how you know accurate this is but I think of it as a developmental disorder and I, I think of it as kind of like we're all because this isn't highly true because a lot of narcissists have problems with their brains okay that children do not but children are very narcissistic extremely they would fit the criteria extremely well but we don't diagnose children with it because they're still developing their brains and their personalities and stuff like this but but nar people with narcissistic personality disorder did not develop into fully functioning emotional adults okay i hope you understand that if just but keep asking me diana keep keep uh asking me what you think and tell me what you think okay thanks and jonathan from missouri hi jonathan you left a really long message, and which is okay. I'm not trying to hit on you. I just don't have time to read it all. So I went down to your question. You said this is a much longer story to write, so I won't put it all here. But to summarize, we had an open marriage. Do not recommend with a BPD. I wouldn't recommend with anyone. And I'm not a uh, pro-conservative, never done it, things like this, okay? I'm speaking from experience. And in two instances, she told me to go do sexual intimate things with another woman. I did, and she blew up at me when I told her. I couldn't understand why, but now I do. She wanted to have a reason to be angry with me so it would validate the things she was already doing behind my back. Is What it is is shame. She hates herself, and here you are up here. If you go do what I do that makes me believe I'm a bad person, now we're more equal and I can accept myself because there's no way you or anybody else can't accept me because I don't accept me. She doesn't accept who she is, her mistakes, her behaviors. She doesn't accept herself. Um, just to put it like short and sweet in a nutshell. Um, I don't know if you've ever discussed this, but it could be a good, it could be good for people to understand this. Those with these disorders will do things to twist reality so they can project onto you the guilt and shame they are feeling. Yeah, because they're not living in reality either. They're delusional, twisting that narrative all the time to be able to accept themselves. We twist narratives, we lie, all of it, because we want to be accepted. 
No, I didn't do that. Well, wouldn't it just be easier to just say, yeah, I did that. I'm sorry. Won't do it again. No. Because I can't live with myself. I can't. I can't accept that I did that. That's how judgmental I am. I would hate somebody else that did that. I would never forgive them. So, uh, it here, and I wrote, people like this may also want you to hit them. I believe there is a lot of psychology here from shame and projection to self-sabotage, right? She's, she's sabotaging her relationship with you. She wants you to sabotage it. She literally is getting you to sabotage the relationship. Um, and the, the hit them part. Um, if I hate myself, I, I may hate myself so much, I can't stand you being good to me. That's why I don't ask for help. Huh, guys? That's why I don't ask for help. That's why I don't accept help. I don't deserve it. What I do deserve is to be hurt like I hurt inside. Punished like I punish myself. Punish me. Hit me. Make sense? Let me know. Thank you. And Salima from France. Hi, Salima. My father used to abuse us as children during the meals, during dinner time. He raged and had to work hard to feed you guys. And your mom did not... Well, us while his mom did not... Okay, so your father didn't get fed growing up. Major problems in that department. And he abuses the family at the dinner table while you're eating. Your mom was a bully. And when you cooked with her as a teenager, she bullied you. My, your son wants to cook with you. He loves that. But that kind of triggers you. Still very difficult. Remember how awful your mom does and your dad... And you feel guilty for not being there for your son and cooking with him. How can I make myself cook with my son? What are the steps I need to take? Um, so, so we've got a past, right? We, a past history of things that really bother us. Okay, so, me, so, so I'm always going to recommend support, uh, uh, professional help, talk. Talk, talk, talk and heal from this, okay? But anything that triggers us, you know, I, the only way to get over it is to face it. Our, try to understand how memory works in our brains. The only thing that we remember is what's emotionally significant, charged. Woo, that birthday when I was seven years old was so fun and all my friends came over and we had a magician and I remember that because I remember the feeling. I don't know what I had for lunch last week. I can't even remember one thing I ate for lunch. Oh, I ate a salad on Tuesday. I can't remember what I, dressing I had and that's it. I don't remember anything. It's like, geez, you can remember 40 years ago but not last week because it was emotionally significant and last week was not. And once these issues aren't emotionally significant, once we process them, talking about them, they don't hurt so much, no more trigger. Now, a lot of this is emotional reaction. The way to, to fix this is to do it, right? To, to cook. And so we want to be very, very slow, Salema. Everything is at your speed. And that's the one thing that people need to learn after this, of these bad relationships, that we have control over speed and we go slow and you don't have to do this at all. You have very good reasons because it makes you feel bad, Salama, so you don't have to, okay? Just because your son wants to doesn't mean you have to. You can put him in a cooking class, okay? We don't have to, and that's not bad mom. That's good, healthy mom taking care of herself. Now, strong mom wants to be stronger, do it, okay? So find ways to do it. A cooking class might be good for you guys. I don't know. Um, Plan one meal. We go really slow, one thing at a time, baby steps. And so find a meal that maybe you guys didn't cook, that you've never cooked before. So it's less triggering. It's not something we had at home. And then that meal, we find out how to cook it. And we just do one step at a time, Salema. Okay, we don't hold ourselves and commit to an actual day that we have to do it. You just find out every ingredient you need. And then one day when you feel like going to the store, you go to the store and you buy everything. And then when you feel like it one day, you put it out and you prep. Okay, Salima. But try to understand that this is simply your brain telling you, this is scary, I don't want to do it. And once we do it, it gets easier. So we always resort back to the last time we did something. Right? Hey, David, do you like going to movies? I'm going to resort back to last week when I went to a movie theater. I'm not going to resort back to eight years old when I went to a movie. Makes sense, right? It's the last thing that happened. And I had a good experience, right? It, it wasn't the greatest movie, but it was a nice theater. And the people weren't sitting next to me and they were quiet. And 
you know, the popcorn was hot and buttery and, uh, you know, I had a good time. So I'm looking forward to next time. If I went to the movie theater, the movie theater, and remember the guy shot up and shot everyone in the movie theater and I survived, I may never go to the movies again because when I think about going to the movies, I'm going back to the very last time. But those people that, that survived that movie theater shooting, if they go again, okay, and everything was okay, now the last time you think about it was okay. That's how our memory works, I promise you. We never go back to the actual incident. We go back to how we remembered it, how we felt about it now, or the last time we thought about it. So you can make positive experiences just by going, doing, and it turns out okay, Slima. If you just make something with your son, I doubt you're going to cut your finger off, I hope. And as long as you don't, the next time you think about cooking, you'll be okay. I promise. That's how it works. Okay? Thanks, Slima. Good luck. Jesse, let us know where you're from, Jesse, next time. Thank you. Trauma Breaking Fam. Hello to all. Jesse here from Brooklyn. You did. Thank you. From Brooklyn. Now, Michigander. Hi, Dave. David. I'm doing incredible work to heal myself from my codependency, but I can continue to rush my goals because I feel I have to now since my original plans with a full-fledged family has changed during the shift and divorce and now step childless. Any ideas on how to take in the roses and slow down. Well, Jesse, I'm sorry about your loss. That's that's huge. Huge. It sounds like you lost a, a marriage and children. I hope that you acknowledge that and don't shrink that, minimize it, brush it on the carpet and say, oh, it hurts too much. Grieve. Okay, I hope you're grieving. Um, any ideas on how to slow down? Well, why don't you, Jess, just make every single thing about you. So write down what you need to do with your children and understand that commitment takes space and time. So find out what you're committed to, Jess. What do you want, right? And commit to that and invest in it every day. Little bits, little bits. Um, and, and this is going to be extremely difficult for you, Jesse. It's really hard for us to change. And so your brain may be accustomed and used to working on what do we do for everybody else, not Jesse. Now it's time for Jesse. Okay, so it's going to take a while. It's a process. Self-awareness, number one. So find out exactly what you need. Find out exactly what you want. Find out exactly how you feel about things. Find out exactly what you value. Okay, and be opinionated. Um, the, the more aware you are, the more you'll know what to do. People that ask me, what should I do? Don't know themselves enough to know that. Right? If I ask anybody, what should I do? Well, if they want to give me a real answer, then they're going to have to know every little thing about me to know what I should do because we're different. I'm not asking somebody, what would you do? Well, what really good would it matter? We're totally different. Oh, what would you do? Oh, then I'll do that. <laughs> so this is a real big, huge process, Jesse, where it's about self-awareness, finding out who you are and, and all those little things I just said. And then you'll know what to do, period. If you know exactly what you need, exactly what you want, exactly how you feel, what you value in your opinion, there you go. There you go. Ways to slow down. Man, just be more mindful of your time. Like I said, write down what you're going to do with your time. Try to schedule it out a little bit. I'm going to spend my time sleeping, spend my time with my children, spend my time with my work, and then I got this little bit of time left and start trying to make that bigger and bigger and bigger right now. Try not to worry about... Um, everything else in the world besides just how I feel. You know, finances and job search and things like this. Let those rest for a little bit right now and find out what you really want, okay? Good luck. And Patia from Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Can you explain with examples why autism is different than narcissism? Like how each would act to the same situation. Yeah, and you can give me examples. I have some experience with autism, okay? And obviously a lot with narcissism. And they're just completely different. Completely different people. Completely. Completely different re people caused by completely different reasons. Okay? And I know we're still understanding both of them. Both of these, but they're very different. And I, and I do understand how, and why I get questions like this a lot. is because um, some of their affect and things like this seem similar. Um, I know that a, a lot of people think autistic people may not have much empathy in the way that they act, you know, but they, they have a real disconnect to their affect, okay? So when you look at an autistic person, you're, you're good luck trying to judge how they feel. 
Okay, it's real common for autistic people to maybe not have much affect up here in their entire forehead. And I can worry, I can be mean, I can be scared, I can be, you know, excited, I can be confused, I can be, and, and if I don't have that, it's harder for you to understand how I feel. Okay? Um, give me some situations instead of me making them up. Make my job easier. So give me, go ahead and give me some situations and I'll, I'll try to guess uh, how each will act. Um, but I don't, I don't really, I, I don't really feel like making up situations myself to help you understand the difference. Um, a major difference that I think people are looking for when they're asking me questions about the two is, is as we know, narcissism doesn't have empathy. And so they're not aware. That means it's not that it just means you're cold and mean. Okay. There, there are people without empathy that don't have to be mean. Right? They understand. They don't want to hurt you, but they just don't understand how you feel, how it makes you feel. They don't get it. Okay? And they they don't care. Narcissists are looking at that and worried about it. When you start telling them, they're like, shut up, I don't care. Eh, oh God. Right? But but the the autistic is just petrified of hurting you. To the point where they don't do anything. They're like, I don't want to hurt you. They care a lot. They can't live with themselves. Okay? Um but they also lack some self-awareness too, okay? Um, so get, go ahead and give me some uh, examples, please. It's an interesting topic, and I think just awareness for everybody is just better for society. Uh, Jennifer again from United Kingdom. David got some great news. Instead of me always wearing black, I've only, I've only gone and got myself an olive green jacket. Can you get your breath? I can't believe it myself. In fact, I've gone and got an olive green vase for my apartment too. Looks wicked with black. Meaning fantastic. Thanks a million. Yeah, because I've I've joked around, and you guys know I'm right. <laughs> that people who have suffered trauma and neglect, things like this. What are our favorite colors? No color, black, gray, and different shades of white, black, and gray. Wow, interesting, colorful. <laughs> Add color to your life, guys. Add color. Seriously, be extreme. Paint your wall red. Go get bright blue, yellow, greens, flowers, and just add color to your life. It's unbelievable what it does. It's creative, and it really literally opens up your brain to healing. Absolute criteria to healing. It's creativity. It's a good way to do it. Thanks, Jennifer. And olive green. That, good. That's a, that's a little step. Good. How about bright green? <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. I read it for, for all of you guys, okay? Uh, Ohio, Rory. Hi, David. Hi, Rory. Would you talk about the narcissist's way of apologizing? They don't. Whenever he would apologize, there would be those few milliseconds of thinking, wow, he really gets it because he was really convincing, wasn't he? He must have really wanted something. <laughs> uh, narcissist's way of apologizing besides not <clears throat> they may be scared to even say the word sorry, right? Or sorry doesn't mean anything. I'll throw it out there anytime. Sorry. Sorry. It's funny how much a narcissist will make I statements. I this and I that and I want this and I'm like this and I'm so good at this and I'm that. But can't say I'm sorry. Sorry. Can't say I love you. Love you. That just, that that's a trigger to me. And you know, you hear it just, and it's no big deal. You know, you hear it at the workplace You'll hear women, you know, they, they hardly know each other. They just work together. It means nothing. They're, love you. Love you, babe. You know, and it's just like, ah, oh, God, girls. No, no. If you force them to say, I love you, they'll stop saying it. <laughs> right? Uh, so anyways, sorry. Sorry. But, and don't ever apologize to somebody and put a but at the end of it. God, Jesus. Pay attention to that. You'll see it all over the place. Look, I'm really sorry I did that, but th you're not sorry. You're just saying it. Rory, I'm so sorry. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Oh my God, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I could do this all day, right? Am I genuine? Of course not. I don't even know what I'm apologizing for. Now, can narcissists do that? I think so. That's what psychopaths do, right? They learn and study. They learn your face and go, oh, this is what it looks like. Oh, I bet. Oh, everybody's doing like this. I better do this too. <laughs> uh, thanks, Rory. Jennifer. Oh, no, sorry. 
That was the last question. Victoria from the Bay Area. Hi, Victoria. I just wanted to ask what your thoughts were on Jada Pinkett and Will Smith. Was that a narcissistic move by Jada because it looked very familiar? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I hate Hollywood. I do. I, I can't stand Hollywood. What, what, just a worse group of people to idealize or to value or to, to imitate or to copy or to take any advice from at all. Because I'm looking at people that are multi-millionaires for pretending to be somebody else. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It, but anyways, so I don't know. I know who Jada Pinkett and Will and I know what happened at the Grammys and all that. Or Oscars. But I, here's what I will say. The one, one thing I noticed right away when I saw that is Will Smith sure seems like a victim of narcissistic abuse. And, and I'm not, I, maybe I should rephrase that. His behaviors that night were extremely similar to an enabling victim of a narcissist in a codependent, abusive, neglectful relationship. That's what that looks like. Because that used to be me, period. That used to be me. You want you want to be in a dangerous situation? Go mess with my girlfriend. Extremely overprotective. Yeah, disgusting. I hate that part of myself, but I accepted it and I changed it long time ago. Uh, that's what it seems like to me. That's just something I've noticed. I don't know about Jada, um, the way she looked at him. I thought it was interesting that that Will thought it was funny until he looked at Jada. And it wasn't just, oh, Jada's hurt. It's almost, it's, it's like a threat to the marriage. It's codependency. And I'm always going to be tested. I'm always going to have to prove, right, how scared I am to lose you. Stuff like this. No matter what, that's not a healthy response from anybody that knows who the hell they are. Unless Will Smith doesn't value, respect, towards other people at all. If he can come out and say, no, I don't value respect for anybody, screw him. Then he knows himself. But if he says he values respect, who in the hell were you that night? In front of millions. In front of your children. In front of your children. That's, those are the people he should really care about who saw that. His freaking children, man. Uh, David, another question for you. So I know you have probably done a video before on this, but could you explain to your audience, LOL, what inferiority complex is? Well, I, I don't want to because you guys are all going to tell me I'm wrong, probably. I'll probably be wrong. And then you guys will hate me. There's an example. Uh, inferiority complex, right? Um, narcissists, right, have that. I'm inferior. So I'm going to look I want to find whatever you look for, right? And if I believe I'm less than you and not good enough and things, if I really believe that, I'm going to find it in everything that you do. Why do you say that? Oh, you think I'm good enough? Why do you say that? Are you going to leave me? Oh, why do you say that? Because somebody else is better looking than me and better than this? Just total inferiority complex. And it, and it, and that, and it comes in all areas of your life. Yeah. Um, let me know what you think. I'm inferior to you and that's my complex so I always believe that right okay um Hannah don't know where you're from I don't I don't know if you said I don't think so maybe let us know next time okay this is a really long one here my sister has BPD diagnosed a year ago <clears throat> she gets paid 2000 a month, but she runs out of money. She's completely irresponsible with money. You share an SUV, but you're the only one that pays. $520 a month. She yells at you when you don't give her money or weed. Then she texts your mom or dad saying that you're abusing her. I don't know what to do. She's told me she will call the cops on me. I'm on probation. I would go to prison for five years if I get a ticket or arrested again. She has kicked me out three times. One time she put my clothes and blankets pillows on the dirt. She doesn't want to get her own phone. 
through her name. She's using my name for her phone. So it's all my credit. I'm exhausted mentally, physically, but by my own sister. I paid rent for two years, and the rent was 1800 a month. I feel like I need to live by myself, but she always texts or tells my mom or dad that she doesn't want to live life no more and that everyone leaves her. Oh, geez. I wanted to leave before because she's being violent and yelling at me, and she exploits me for my money. I feel like I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm talking, taking care of her. We were both 24. How are you and your sister both 24? Unless you're twins. Our, our B-Day... Oh, our B-Day was on March 21, and I didn't... So she's your twin sister. And I didn't feel like I had a good time. I was stressed out by my sister. I need help. Like, I don't know if I should try and build their relationship with my sister. Oh, gosh. I'm so sorry. Aren't you trying? That's what you are trying. It's not working. So we stop trying because you're the only one trying. Guys, a relationship. I'm relating to another person and we're on a ship together. I, mean, I don't know what else to say. This is awfully sad. And you and, and, and I'm going to tell you, Hannah, what to do real quick and then we're done. But I'm not saying it's easy or going to be real quick. It Obviously, this is very difficult for you. Helpless, hopeless, anxious, depressed. Yeah, that's you. That's Hannah. Hannah, I, I could, I could if, if I was your life coach, we would take our time and really go down this and explore it to help you really understand what you want, what you need, how you feel, what you value, and who you are so you can make the right decision for you. But I'm going to go by you like most of us that don't want to be abused and stuff like this and you don't know what to do. So I'm just going to quickly tell you, Hannah, okay? And this is just one option. You have, there's many and you don't have to do anything. This might help you and I don't know if just telling you will help. You may know all these things. What you really need, Hannah, is professional help and we all need help, especially in some times of our lives. Get help to do this, Hannah. Take that money that you give her and spend it on a, someone that can help you a professional of any kind that just knows what to do, okay? You need support, and your mom and dad ain't going to support you guys. They helped you guys get like this. This is just awful. Gosh, and so now you feel, so, so she threatens to commit suicide, and then she threatens to call the police on you. That is danger, Hannah. You are in an extremely dangerous situation. Physically and emotionally and psychologically, this is extremely dangerous. Extremely. She uses drugs. She probably drinks. She uh, is abusive and lies and threatens. Dude, she is out of control. She can't control herself, and you can't either. So if you were my client, we would go down and, and, and really take time to help you understand. But I'm just going to tell you the best thing to do, Hannah. And that is to get far away from her. Whatever you're doing that she's afraid to call, that you're afraid to go back to jail for, stop doing it. Because I didn't understand why you're so afraid that you're going to go back to jail because she says she's going to call the police on you. Then get away from her, Hannah. She is danger, and there's only one thing you can do, and it's run. Because you can't fight her, you can't fix this, you can't control her. And you're going to go to jail trying. You don't want to go to jail, you're going to... By interacting and living with her. You're not going to go to jail because you're done with her. Because you leave her. You're not responsible for her. You even said down here. You, you, you feed her and tell her to drink water. But she doesn't. My God, dude. Do you bathe her? What does she do when she has her period? I mean, this is, this is sick. This is sick, okay? This is sick. And I understand you don't know what to do. So, Hannah... We're going to stop doing anything illegal that will put us back to jail, okay? And we're going to come up with a plan immediately for you to get the hell out of that house. And I'm not kidding. I would think about a woman's shelter if that's what it takes to get out. Do anything you can to get out of that situation. Break your lease. You can pay to get out of leases. You cancel that phone. And you stop being scared, Hannah. Stop being scared. And understand that why you're scared is because you have a life of danger, you have danger in your life, and you need to get rid of that danger. And if you had children, think about you you have a child. What would you do if you had a child in the house? You wouldn't keep her there and try to, you know, you'd remove that child from the house. And that's what you need to do for yourself, okay? And mom and dad aren't healthy either. They're not going to help you. 
They help you get like this. And they help your sister do this to you. And they don't want you to leave. They want you to keep doing this. And they're not going to do anything to change your sister. They're going to try, but they can't. This, this is sick. You're, you're enabling your sister, Hannah. You're enabling this kind of behavior. Try to understand that you are a completely different person than your sister. Completely different. You guys are enmeshed. Okay? You're a completely different person. She's not like you, Hannah. Not today. Can we accept that? So when you figure out who you are, Hannah, and you say, I value respect and honesty and integrity and loyalty, and then you have to say, your sister does not. Not your sister does. She's not showing it. We're just going to make her. I'm going to help her. No, we're just going to accept your sister for who she is today. And what are you going to do about it? Get the hell out of this situation. Oh, my God. And if she puts her hands on you, which she does, then you call the police. You don't allow this. Put her in jail and get the hell out of there. Like I said, you may know all this. It's easy for me to say. It's harder for you to do. But we only have this much time, and this is how much time we have. If we can't do something, we need help. Okay? If you feel like you can't do this, you need help. Or do it. Okay? Good luck, Hannah. But what she's doing to you is abuse and trauma, and it's not your fault. Okay? But you've got to protect yourself. You've got to get out of there. You're in an extremely codependent family. And that means that all of you guys are going to have problems and none of you guys are going to fix them. And all of you guys are going to stay together like this forever. Forever. There is no changing this. Your sister has severe issues. Severe. Sounds like she has a personality disorder. And she has so many problems. Can't imagine how many other disorders she has. That's it, guys. Good luck, Hannah. Thank you, all of you. I encourage all of you, go down below and always read the comments. They're great. Better than the video. Take care of you guys, of yourselves. Okay, guys? Love yourself first, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.